Trumpists as well, well, Trumpists as well as Dugin appear to want to preserve the conservative and religious values within the family and of society. They are clearly in opposition to this one world, transgendered, homosexual, transhumanist dystopia that Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum agents are trying to bring about with their great reset. To Dugin's further credit, he is, to my surprise, this is a list, to Dugin's further credit, he is anti-communism, or in today's world, anti-socialism, anti-fascism, anti-colonialism, anti-progressivism, anti-capitalism, anti-slavery, anti-materialism, anti-atheism, he's pro-Christian, he's pro-Islam, he's pro-spirituality, he's pro-traditional values, he's pro-sacred ancient beliefs and teachings. This is all despite his very dubious earlier life, despite some questionable associations he has had, and despite what his personal religious beliefs currently are or has been. And he is even, now check this bit out, and he is even anti-modern medicine, anti-vaccines, anti-technology, he's against DNA altering, etc. And, this will surprise people as well, and he is pro-Hydra. He's got a special section where he's talking about making exodus from the big industrial cities, returning to real life on the earth, practicing agriculture. Agriculture. This is all very much in line with our fitra. My question to you, Sheikh, is, as Muslims, or hopefully as Mu'min's believers, should we take the side of Dugin's fourth political theory and be part of their great awakening simply because they are against the greater evil of the World Economic Forum soul destroying great reset? It must have been 10 years ago. Thank you for bearing patience. Uh, we had a few problems with the mic. It's great to have you back here in London, Sheikh. With the speed at which things were accelerating in 2021, it looked like that was going to be your last trip. But Alhamdulillah, here we are. It goes to show that they plan, but Allah also plans. And indeed, Allah is the best of all planners. How was your Ramadan in Trinidad? We praise and we thank Allah. And we are grateful to Him for all that He's done for us. We are grateful to Him for having protected us from so long. And especially at this time, these last 18 months, that uh, attacks have been constantly launched against me. My profile of scholarship appears to be a threat to so many. And I understand that the, the attacks always will continue so long as I'm alive and even after Allah calls me away from this world, they still be attacking me. So Ramadan was wonderful in Trinidad. Um, my daughter was doing her final year exams at the University of the West Indies. She was very busy and yet she took time off every night of Ramadan after I would return home from the Salat of Tarawi to record a video and then to upload it. And that's how you're able to get a video from me every day of Ramadan. We thank Allah and we thank my daughter Hira, yes. Yes, that was quite an incredible effort. We really did appreciate seeing a video from yourself every day. And and how about your flight back to the UK? <coughs> Allah was kind. Allah was kind to me. Yes, uh, that we got the funding for my ticket, and uh, uh, I had a very pleasant flight. British Airways uh, treated me very well. Alhamdulillah, I ordered a Muslim meal. And I got some Korean rice. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. That's good. Okay, so Sheikh, we'll try not to waste any time. We'll respect your time as well. Um, so this interview was initially planned in September 2021 when you were last here as the second half of that Absolute Truth interview that we carried out with yourself. 
The first half was more focused on the theological aspects of our deen, and the second half that was planned was more on the geopolitical side. But mm. time was short, and perhaps this topic was too early for the general public to be receptive to. Since then, however, another manufactured or engineered crisis has taken place two years after the first, in the form of the Russian conflict with Ukraine and the West. The Russian conflict with Ukraine and the West. Muslims have learned a lot more on this topic since then. So now as Muslims, you say that we are preparing for the arrival of the three main actors onto the world stage as we draw close, closer to the end of history. For this reason, we are also seeking to join our Christian brothers and sisters in the resistance to any form of the Jalik united power and oppression. On this note, regarding the Nasara, I know you have identified Russia as Rum or the, or the New Rome in the Quran. I won't ask you how you arrived to this conclusion as you have an upcoming lecture in London titled Who is Rum in the Quran? I will also not ask you whether you see Putin as being the second Dhulkar name because you hold the view that our name in the Quran is referred to an age or an epoch, and so we should also do the same as Allah has done in not identifying the Dhulqar name as a person. Don't expect me yeah. in this interview yeah. to give a lecture on room. No, I'm just... <laughs> I can't do that. No, no. Right. Uh, what I can do, however, is to advise, uh, and gently so, that those who want to study the subject of room and to answer the question, who is room, to gently advise proper methodology. And always, if a subject is, the, is mentioned in the Quran by name, then proper methodology is you begin your study with the Quran. Proper methodology also is that the Hadith cannot contradict the Quran. So if your primary source of information directs you to Rome, the Hadith cannot direct you in another direction. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is enough for those of you who sincerely wish to pursue the truth in the matter. The Quran has mentioned a surah named after Rome. It's called Surah to Rome. And hence, this is a subject of significant importance in the Qur'an that Allah should give a name of a surah to be surah to Rum. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the name Rum is mentioned in that surah by name at the beginning of that surah. So we have no excuse for ignoring the Qur'an and giving precedence to the Hadith. This is not proper scholarship. This is for, <laughs> excuse me, schoolboys will do this, okay? <laughs> I mean no disrespect to anyone when I use the word schoolboy. I'm just, men, I'm just my, my intention is to direct you to deficiency in your scholarship. That's all. Deficiency. And you should not mind it. I am 80 something years of age by the moon. I have traveled so extensively. I've studied so much. I've written all of these books. So I do have some credentials to teach and to advise. Don't be annoyed with me. Now then, in the Quran, in Surah to Rum, Allah speaks about Rum. And when he does so, we recognize from those verses of the Surah that Rum is Constantinople. Rome is not Washington mm -hmm. and London and Paris. No, Rome is Constantinople. And from Constantinople, you had a parting of ways. And one part of Rome went to the west. And the other part remained in Constantinople. But when you study, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I had this cough during Ramadan. I still have it up to now. <laughs> I notice that once I don't open my mouth, I don't cough. <laughs> so it is something that irritates the, yeah. the system. When I open my mouth to speak, then I do the coughing. So please bear with me. Mm -hmm. You've been bearing with me all through Ramadan, mm -hmm. so you could bear with me now that I'm in London. And this is my first uh, session in London. And uh, alhamdulillah, although it was a long journey and I was tired, I feel refreshed now. I had a nice hot cup of tea. So I'm ready now. <laughs> I'm ready now. So there was a parting of ways in Constantinople, and that part which came to the West, Allah condemned them in the Quran. You, you don't know it, go and do your homework. That part which remained in Constantinople, Allah blessed them. 
and they had a victory. Goldie put a room, and Allah said there'll be two victories. Min Kabul will be back. The second victory is still to come. Rome, <coughs> when Constantinople was taken by the Ottoman Empire, that was not by accident. The applause and the victory, we won, we won the victory, we conquered Constantinople, but you do not understand the Jal. Sometimes I also can't understand the Jal. And he attacks me and then only later I realize and then I suffer as I'm now suffering. Yes, I'm suffering now because I didn't recognize the attack of the Jal all these years. Yeah. So now then, <coughs> when Constantinople was taken by the Ottoman Empire, then Rome moved to Moscow. Rome is now in Moscow. Why? Because Constantinople was taken by the Jal. Okay. And uh, Allah says in the Quran that there'll be two victories. And again in Surah al kaf there's Karnain. So in the first Karn, Gog and Magog were contained and rendered harmless. In the second Karn, it has to be the same thing. This is enough for us to recognize that Russia has a historic role to play in history, waiting to occur. Okay. Jazakla Khair for that uh, quick summary. Um, can, can you also recall about how Allah has used a valim, an oppressor in the past, to bring about his will on earth? Um, there are instances in the past where Allah has used a valim uh, to fulfill his purposes. There in the Quran, it's also there in the Hadith. Um, <coughs> and I'm trying to recall now, but uh, you surprised me with this question, so it's a little difficult for me to find now. Um, Allah using a zalim. Ah, yes, I can give you one example. Yeah. But I was deceived. Mm -hmm. It took me years to be able to understand. The Orthodox Christian Russia was a, was a backward state with an agrarian economy and the social system was based on serfdom. This is a, <laughs> the beginning of the 20th century. And Allah had his plan and they had their plans. But Allah planned it in such a way to deceive them. And they didn't recognize. So they thought they had won a great victory when the Bolshevik Revolution took place and the Tsar and his whole family were killed. Even the Russian people themselves probably are still unaware of the Lord at work, his handiwork. And uh, the Wall Street was directly involved in the Bolshevik Revolution. And they felt, the Zionists felt that they had a great, achieved a great victory. And then <laughs> came the birth of the Soviet Union as, <laughs> excuse me, as an atheist state. And then the Soviet Union launched a vicious, vicious, vicious attack on the Orthodox Christian world, destroying the monasteries and killing the priests and so on. And Washington and, the, and Wall Street were happy. The Zionists were happy. We're getting what we want. We want to destroy Russia. They didn't realize the Lord God was using Azarim to fulfill his purpose. Okay. And then slowly, Russia under the Soviet Union became a scientifically and technologically powerful nation. Overnight. And the agrarian economy was transformed to an industry. Ukraine became hot, the heart of the industrial economy of Europe, of, Europe, of Russia. Mm -hmm. and, <coughs> and the Soviet Union <laughs> became a powerful, military powerful state, a superpower. In a little time, good. even the economy, the um, ag agricultural economy was transformed. And Russia became a full basket of the wall. You see, all of these things did under 
Soviet rule, mm-hmm. an atheist Soviet rule, and Muslims suffered under the Soviet Union. Yes, they they they, they attack all religions. Mm-hmm. But look at that. When the time came for Allah's plan to fulfill, be fulfilled, the Soviet Union folded up and disappeared. Okay? And they believed that they had won a great victory. <laughs> but look what happened. As soon as the Soviet Union folded up and disappeared, within a short period of time, Russia returned to her Orthodox Christian heart. And the same Orthodox Christian world that you wanted to see destroyed, Allah has now blessed them to become more powerful than you are. Russia is now the most powerful military state in the world. If that was not power that Russia had, they would have intervened in Ukraine already. Mm-hmm. Yes. They did it in the Crimean war. Why, why are they afraid to come? No, uh, what they're doing now is incrementally trying to avoid defeat in Ukraine because that's, Russia is achieving all that she wanted. Russia got Crimea. Then Russia got uh, it, it got um, to to demilitarize Ukraine because all her military installations have been destroyed. And uh, Russia is winning the battle now for Donbass. Mm-hmm. That's all Russia wants. Russia doesn't want the whole of Ukraine at all. Mm-hmm. Only a schoolboy will believe that. And so <coughs> now that they are facing defeat in Ukraine and all the propaganda they have would not hide it, the new plan is to try to expand the war and get Poland to join and some of their side so they could get more fighting going. This is, But Russia is going to be uh, the most powerful state in the world. And this is Allah's promise in the Quran, which is being fulfilled. What is it? 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 What is I'm going to raise those who follow you, O oh Jesus, high above, dominant over those who have rejected. This is now taking place before our eyes. Yeah. So here is an example of Allah using the Zalim to fulfill his purpose. Yeah. So on, on, that, on that note, the East and the West, which side has the possibility of religion being revived? And which side looks doomed with the punishment of Allah? I know it's a straight, straightforward, simple question. It is very plain mm. and clear that despite <laughs> their success with the US dollar sponsored regime change in Pakistan, it is plain and clear that the Pakistani people mm. are not betraying mm. their religion. Mm. They're they are opposed to American imperialism. They don't want Pakistan to be an American republic. Only the chief of staff of the Pakistan armed forces and his puppy dogs. They are the ones who want America, <laughs> Pakistan to be an American republic. And the, the politicians who are only in, involved in Power politics, they want to gain power by whatever means necessary, including some Maulanas and them. But the people of Pakistan have recognized that in Imran Khan, they have a leader who cannot be bought. <laughs> Not with a mountain of coal, you can't buy this man. So despite the mistakes he has made, they still remain faithful to him. So you, you, you have an example in Pakistan of a people from the East who cannot be bought by Dajjal. Mm -hmm. But when you come to the West, you see that in the West, you have a large number of sheep and cattle and goats now. And when the people from Pakistan and Bangladesh and so on come here, and the Arabs come here, they're somehow submerged and become part of this melting pot. And most of them become sheep and cattle, uh, and they have eyes and they don't see. And so they dance to every tune that the child plays. Not all of them, because you'll have Pakistanis here in Britain, in the United States, who support Imran Khan, support the people of Pakistan. Not all of them, but the large numbers of them are like that. So the writing is on the wall. In the con- in the in the rivalry between East and West 
It is West which is sinking down, sinking down, yes, and will not survive. Okay, so now in preparation for this interview, I read Alexander Dugan's book, The Great Awakening versus Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forums, The Great Reset. Now, many of our viewers on Endgame Eschatology will be pleased that we'll be now addressing this because most of the people who follow our channel are very much familiar with Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum's Great Reset. So before I go any further on this book, I would like the listeners to know that I try to be as unbiased as possible and that I have frequently looked at anti-Putin, anti-Dugin, anti-Russian and even anti-Sheikh material for a couple of years now. I am very much aware of the occultists, chaos magic symbolism, and of their belief in creating order out of chaos, also known as Ordo Ab Chao. I am also well aware of the connections to the Israeli traditionalist, traditionalist Avig Dor Eskin, the Yuzinski, Yuzinski group, Bolshevism, Nazism, Fascism, Crowleyism, and Satan, Satanism. Having said that, Sheikh, I would like to begin with some questions based on excerpts from Alexander Dugan's latest book. So today's, most, to, today's modern Western society has many popular intellectuals, such as Jordan Peterson, just to name one, that are teaching that the individual matters the most. This is what they're teaching, that the individual matters the most. I have recently heard yourself say that Islam teaches the contrary. Alexander Dugan says that the individual is the last word of the liberal. The more I ponder over these words, the more I start to see words such as selfishness, animalistic or demonic behavior. The story of arrogant and isolated Iblis comes to mind. My question to you, Sheikh, is as Muslims, should we be totally against any form of liberalism and individualism? Nabi Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, is our leader and our guide. And Allah has commanded us in the Quran, follow him. In kuntum ba'dahuzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. In kuntum tuhibboon Allah fattabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. If you love me, follow him. I will love you. What did he leave? Did he leave an individual or did he leave a jama'ah? Answer, he didn't leave an individual. He left a jama'ah. So the answer is as plain as a daylight. Our primary obligation is to the jama'ah. The jama'ah. In fact, there's a hadith, there's no Islam without the jama'ah. And there is no jama'ah without a sama wa ta'atu. That is, listening and obeying. Discipline. Discipline. You can't have the sheep going in every single direction. You have to be a disciplined sheep. That's why the imam, we have to remind him now, before you read this salah, the imam was turn around. They're scared to do that always. They're just scared to do that. Turn around and look at the jama'ah. See that the people are standing in straight lines. See that it's an organized before you lead the salat. But usually the imam is a paid employee. He's scared to turn around and face. I, I looked at this all through Ramadan. So we have to put the emphasis on the jama'ah and on the discipline of the Jama'ah. And this is one of the reasons why I have had so much respect for Maulana Abu Lala Mauduri. And after him to Dr. Israr Ahmad. May Allah have mercy upon them both. I have never seen the Sufis organize themselves <laughs> in, the, in the way that Maulana Mauduri organized the Jama'at Islami. And Dr. Israr Ahmed organized the Tanzimi Islami. And there must be examples in other parts of the world of this disciplined Jama. May Allah bless them both. So my answer to you is that they may have the individual mm -hmm. as their priority. And so they're all going to go in several different directions. And you will not have a disciplined society. Society will disintegrate. 
Every, every single one has his own conception of truth. But on this side, in the world of Islam, in the world of Christianity, we would want to have a disciplined organization, disciplined society, where we come together, we have a leader, and that leader is rightly guided, and we follow him. We follow him, yes. Okay, yeah, Jazakallah here. Um, so clearly the collective is more important than the individual. Liyadullahi fawqal jama'ah. Allah's hand is on the jama'ah. Jama so would you say that this is the ultimate disguise strat strategy of divide and conquer by pushing this whole individualism? It's not divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. It is putting in place the recipe for the uh, demolition of society. A society which places the emphasis on the individual mm -hmm. is eventually going to self-destruct. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening in the West today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a society in a state of collapse. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I read the book and because I know that you haven't had a chance to read the book, Dugin, who is the founder and the leader of the international Eurasia movement, labels Western political modernity and liberalism as a twin disease. He labels Western political modernity and liberalism as a twin disease. He says Trumpists as well, well, Trumpists as well as Dugin appear to want to preserve the conservative and religious values within the family and of society. They are clearly in opposition to this one world transgendered, homosexual, transhumanist dystopia that Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum agents are trying to bring about with their great research. To Dugin's further credit, he is, to my surprise, this is a list, to Dugin's further credit, he is anti-communism, or in today's world, anti-socialism, anti-fascism, anti-colonialism, anti-progressivism, anti-capitalism, anti-slavery, anti-materialism, anti-atheism. He's pro-Christian, he's pro-Islam, he's pro-spirituality, he's pro-traditional values, he's pro-sacred ancient beliefs and teachings. This is all despite his very dubious earlier life, despite some questionable associations he has had, and despite what his personal religious beliefs currently are or has been. And he is even, now check this bit out, and he is even anti-modern medicine, anti-vaccines, anti-technology, he's against DNA altering, etc. And, this will surprise people as well, and he is pro-Hydra. He's got a special section where he's talking about making exodus from the big industrial cities, returning to real life on the earth, practicing agriculture. agriculture. This is all very much in line with our fitra. My question to you, Sheikh, is as Muslims, or hopefully as Mu'min's believers, should we take the side of Dugin's fourth political theory and be part of their great awakening simply because they are against the greater evil of the World Economic Forum soul-destroying great research? It must have been 10 years ago. I was resident in Malaysia and uh, Dugin, uh, Professor Dugin, Alexander Dugin reached out to me and I was surprised and pleasantly surprised uh, with an invitation to come to lecture at the State University of Moscow that they were very pleased with what they saw and learned from me, my profile in Islamic scholarship. At that time, he was the chairman of the Department of Sociology which embraced also political science uh, at the State University of Moscow. And this is the largest university and most prestigious university in the whole of Russia. And uh, I eventually traveled uh, to Moscow in 2013, just for one week. And it was a marvelous experience for me. I was treated with respect. I was treated with affection in the university. Uh, I gave a lecture there, I had an interview with D Dugin, and I traveled around in Moscow and so on. Wherever I went, I was treated with respect. I can't expect the same thing in the West, no. Um, <coughs> yes, you are right, uh, OS, I'm proud to see that you do so much reading. I wish I had the time to do it. I have not read um, 
Dugin's book so far, but you have done it. I'm very happy to see this. In fact, when Allah calls me away from this world, I'll be leaving happily. That I've planted seeds and there are so many students of mine now, so many people attached to me and who will not dismiss, dismiss me and turn away from me because somebody put a, 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 a nasty video, a film in a man's private life and bring it in the public to then turn away from me. No, you, you, you have to separate private life from public life. And if someone in the public is disgraceful, yes, yeah, turn away from me. When something from private is brought out, sinfully so, and it comes to you, you should just delete it. Yes, delete it. So I am now uh, very pleased to see so many of you rising, mashallah, and you, always, I'm proud of you, that uh, you will tomorrow be, <laughs> mashallah, many, many brilliant scholars of Islam coming who will be different in the profile of scholarship from what is produced by the Darul Um. I'm not battering the Darul Um. I'm not, I don't have hatred in my heart for you. I'm just trying to tell you that your model of scholarship is deficient. That's all. You continue with that. What will you produce? You will not be able to produce the scholar that we want in this age. I'm asking you to turn away from that model and to turn this model which produced Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, which produced Mulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, which produced Imran. This is the model for the future. So I'm not, I don't hate you. You're closing the doors of the masjid on me. May Allah forgive you. You all turning against me. May Allah forgive you. I just want good for you that you could turn to this model of scholarship which will change you. So now then, what should we do with Dugin and his model of scholarship? My answer is, <laughs> always I have spent the last few years of my life and I'm now about to embark on yet another effort. As soon as I leave um, Britain, I have decided to cancel Belgium um, and I'll be going straight to, to Netherlands. And it's going to be exciting there in Netherlands. I'm the first time. Um, someone has been translating my books to, to Dutch and may Allah bless her and build a house in Jannah for her. So several of my books are now going to be printed in Dutch. <laughs> After Rotterdam and Amsterdam, I'm going to Armenia, which is going to be exciting in Armenia, although it's one week, because my students are arranging for me to meet with the Orthodox Christian Church in Armenia and with intellectuals there. It's going to be exciting. And then from there to Russia, if I get a visa, one second visit, to, and then to Switzerland and to Greece. Greece is important because the Greek people have been happy to hear that our prophet has prophesied that we will conquer Constantinople. They don't have to do it. And my view is that when we conquer Constantinople, we'll return Hagia Sophia to them, to the Greek, not to the Russian, to the Greek. So they are so happy in Greece. And my book, Constantinople in the Quran, has been translated to Greek and we launch it there. And then I go to Albania and Macedonia. Again, in Albania and Macedonia, you have Muslims and Orthodox Christians. Why am I doing this all these years? I'm working to build fraternity between the world of Islam and the world of Orthodox Christianity. Fraternity between Islamic scholarship and Orthodox Christian scholarship. I'm working for this and some people are saying now that Imran is a pioneer of this fraternity which is now emerging. So certainly we we'll want to embrace Dugin embrace his scholarship and build fraternity between our, our scholarship and his scholarship. And in the process of building fraternity, interacting ways, we'll both benefit. Mm. It, do, it does appear so, yes. Um, so Dugan also says that Satanists such as Crowley, LeVay, Lovecraft are not the real concern as they do not hide and are open about what they do and believe. 
Rather, he says, it is modern science and modern culture that is the real black magic. This is what he says in his book. Rather, it is modern science and modern culture that is the real black magic, as modern civilization is a prepar preparation for a Dajjal, the Antichrist. These are his words. Can you provide us any reminders from your eschatolo eschatological studies that support this statement of Dugan's? We don't turn to the word magic right. and the word sorcery and so on in a, in, a, in a limited context. We do it in a bigger context because in the Quran, in Surah to Sabah, I think it is, uh, when Suleiman al-Islam was given the vision, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ سُلَيْمَانَ وَالْقَيْنَ عَلَى كُرْسِيهِ جَسَتُمْ مَعَنَاتِ In that passage, when Suleiman asked Allah, وَهَبْ لِي مُلْكًا لَا يَنْبَغِي لِأَحَدٍ مِنْ بَعْدِ Grant me a kingdom which none can inherit after me, and also grant me a kingdom which will be incomparable, none can compare with it after me. In the response from Allah, he gave him the jinn, the shayateen of the jinn, to work for him. Good? And Allah spoke about the shayateen in construction of high buildings and going down into the depths of the ocean and the earth and so on. The heaven, the sky and the earth. Ya ma'ashar al-jinni, ya ma'ashar al-jinni walins. إِنْ إِسْتَتَعْتُ مَنْ تَنْفُذُوا مِنْ أَقْتَارِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ سَمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So the jinn are at work and these are not the jinn who are Muslim, these are the jinn who are shayateen, it's there in the Quran. So we know that modern Western civilization, cryptocurrency and all, is supported by these evil beings. This is nothing new for us. We are aware of this, okay? And we are not surprised, therefore, when the jinn are attacking us, attacking us in this way. But there's a way to protect yourself. Why is it that we have been teaching again and again, begging on my students, make sure you recite the Quran every day. Make sure that you recite the correct Jews. Make sure that you do not cut any surah, the Quran in them. This is the best gift I have given to you in my life. When I leave this world, this is the gift I'm leaving with you, that all my students will be reciting the Quran every day and completing the Quran every month. If you do this, the Quran will protect you. Yep. Jazakallah uh, khair. Okay, so I remember also Sheikh Umar Balush uh, saying that the nature of Batil, the nature of Batil is such that it needs a leg of truth to stand on. It needs a leg of truth on which to stand on, yes. He mm. uh, <laughs> says in the Quran, don't blame me, blame yourself. I didn't tell you to do that. Iblis is speaking the Quran. Okay. And the Prophet said, he spoke the truth, even though he's Iblis, he spoke the truth. So yes, the, the Sheikh Omar is correct. May Allah bless Sheikh Omar Baloch. I'm proud of him and his work. That they do have a leg of truth on which to stand because if you produce, if you have a snake, and you have a snake with the head not hidden, everybody will see it. You have to hide the head of the snake. Why do you think banks are giving away so many computers as gifts? <laughs> Why are banks giving away so many computers as gifts? Because they want to hide the head of the snake. Absolutely. The, re the reason why I bring that up is because, again, a lot of our viewers will be familiar when they're suspicious. So I brought up the nature of Batil for that reason, because many say that both warring factions on the East and the West represent two sides of the same coin. Uh, they say that this is also represented in the Scottish Rite Masonic double-headed eagle symbol found on their flags, the occultic East versus the occultic West. It I, I have to mention this. 
Therefore, some claim that we should keep clear of the chaos being brought by both sides, as even the side wanting to preserve religion may have its own nefarious, insidious agenda. My question to you, Sheikh, is should we, your students, remain skeptical, impartial, and cautious, or should we drop what seems to have become this insane purity testing of everyone and everything that someone says and does? And maybe instead of purity testing everyone, we should be active in promoting the good words and messages that come from Eastern Orthodox Russia. There is a litmus test. When you recognize someone is going astray, there is a way to deal with it. And Allah has given that way in Surah al -Kam. Every single one of us make mistakes. Every single one of us. None, no one is free from sin. What do you do when you find people going astray? How do you deal with them? Even if they are Christians or Hindus or what? In Surah al -Kaf, we are introduced to the most learned of all men, who is the model of a guide in the end times. And he is Khidr alayhi salam. I am not Khidr. No, I am just a humble, simple teacher. I teach the Quran to the best of my ability. I am not a Khidr, so don't tell me I'm a Khidr, no. But when Musa alayhi salam, who symbolizes his ummah, an ummah, a people who believe that they are the chosen people of the Lord God, that they are born superior to the rest of mankind, they are a privileged people, they are the elite of mankind, this arrogance in them. So Musa symbolizes alayhi salam, his ummah. And when Musa went to Khidr al-Islam and said, I want to follow you to learn from you. Look at how Khidr responded. When someone comes to you and is hungry, his heart is thirsty for the truth, and he is humble, you treat him nicely. You treat him kindly. You treat him with love. And you have endless patience with such a person. But when someone comes to you with boxing mobs, with a chip on their shoulder, arrogant, as though they've never committed any sin ever in their life, and they are the elite of mankind, what do you do with such people? Khidr al-Islam said, No, 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 you can't travel with me. You'll never be able to show patience with me. How can you when you cannot even can penetrate the, this, the, the, you cannot encompass the scholarship I have for you? The knowledge. So then when Musa Islam said, I'll show patience, what did he say? You can come. Don't ask me any questions. Look at that. Don't ask me any questions. This is how you treat these people who have this arrogance and they want to be argumentative. They believe that they're ever right and nobody else is right. And I am wrong and you're wrong. So leave these people. But others who are willing to learn, then you treat these people, you pay attention to those who want to learn, who have sincerity in their hearts, who have hunger in their hearts. These you have to be patient with them, loving with them, kind with them, teach them. And these are the ones who will be able to benefit, whether they are Christians or Muslims. There's so many Christians now listening to me. So many Christians who want to learn from me. Yeah. Why? Because I have treated them with respect. Yeah. And no boxing gloves, not at all. So between the world of Islam and the world of Orthodox Christianity, don't jump up on a table, take the shahada, take the shahada. This is wisdom. Is this wisdom? That's the school boy. Allah says, call people, call people to the way of Allah with wisdom. This is what I have done, and mashallah, look at the results. While I'm still alive, before I've gone from the world, look at the results, alhamdulillah. Okay. Yep. Yeah.
Mm-hmm. On, on the note of Eastern Orthodox Russia, I know you hold the view that the people of Russia are slowly returning to, the, to their Orthodox Christian roots. Do you mean the average ordinary citizen slowly returning to its Orthodox roots? and not necessarily the corrupt leaders, government, politicians, and the elite? And should we take note of the distinction between returning and returned? I.e., when we say returning, it means they've begun the transition. And when you say returned, it's completed. Russia already has the best leadership in the world today. It's not becoming. It's not transforming. It's already established. The Russian government represents the best government in the world today, the most mature government in the world today. This, they saw what happened in 2014. They realized what happened in 2014. They were able to act in 2014 to salvage and to get Crimea back to where Russia is. It was formerly, formerly Russian territory and now is back again as Russia. That was a wonderful, wonderful example that the Russian government was not asleep. Uh, is Russia returning to her orthodox Christian rule? Go to Russia and answer, tell them that you should pass a law that a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. See what they do with you in Russia? Huh? If you go to America, Britain, France, or the West, and you oppose this, they say you're suffering from a disease called homophobia. <laughs> but there you could see ev- evidence in Russia. I don't need any lectures from any of my critics. You can see the evidence already in Russia, substantial evidence, that Russia is returning to her Orthodox Christian rule. And that does not make Russia hostile to Islam. When Russia returned to the Orthodox Christian roots, Russia um, ignored the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow, ignored them, and built the biggest masjid, the biggest masjid in the whole of Europe in Moscow, despite the fact that the Russian Orthodox Church was not yet ready for that. The government did. So Russia returning to her Orthodox Christian heart is a good sign for the world of Islam. And so so many say many say to me quite frequent for, many say to me quite frequently that those who follow the Trinity are misguided. Are there any examples of the past where Allah had blessed or favored those who worshipped him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, despite their misguidance towards the Trinity? I have already spoken on this subject so many times, but it goes through one air, it comes out of the other because it is uncomfortable for those critics of mine. I have explained the Quran on this subject. It goes through one air, it comes out the other air. They don't want to hear what is uncomfortable for them. I pointed out to them that Constantinople or Rome at the time of Nabi Muhammad <laughs> had already embraced the Trinity, was already worshipping Jesus as the Son of God. And yet, in the lifetime of the Prophet <laughs> Allah helped them. Allah helped them. Here is evidence as plain as sunshine that despite the fact that Allah condemns the Trinity, condemns the worship of Jesus as the Son of God and the second person, he condemns it in the Quran, yet in his wisdom, he chose to help them. And they were victorious with his help. Here's the evidence. But as I said, Wes, I can repeat this a hundred million times. It goes through one air, it comes out of the other air, there are people who will refuse. They refuse to submit to the Quran. Yeah. We're familiar with this. This, uh, this is actually a question because it's usually a response from what you said. I'm yesterday. fed up with people who choose not to drink, not to think. Mm-hmm. And I'm fed up with people who are refusing to submit to truth in the Quran. Fed up with them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so back to Dugin's book again. 
The Great Awakening is a term that Dugin says is coined by the QAnons, the Trumpists, and Alex Jones followers. Dugin also says that Trumpism is more important than Trump himself. Uh, I, I loved when I read this in his book. It, it just blew me away. Dugin, Dugin says that Trumpism is more important than Trump himself. Um, it appears this is what you are trying to show us, that Duganism is more important than Dugin himself, because people are very quick to character assassinate and find all kinds of secrets or connections. So that's what it appears to me, that Duganism is more important than Dugin himself. And so the details of what he believes or what secret society he may or may not belong to does not matter as much. A bit like Gandhi, who, whom you frequently quote. Am I right in saying that the shirk that, or the polytheism that he practiced did not matter as much as the good words he spoke or the good values he held and the good actions that he carried out? My question to you, Sheikh, is this. Is this the lens with which you are looking at the likes of Trump, Putin, Dugin, and maybe some other leaders of the past? I have no comment to make on Professor Dugin's private life or personal life. No comment to make on that. I have not studied his books, so I cannot comment on them. You have studied it, and I'm proud of you always for having done that. What I can say is that Dugin reached out to me when I was in Malaysia and mentioned how pleased they were with my profile of scholarship in Islamic eschatology when my own people were rejecting me. <laughs> and they're still rejecting me to this day. I'm accustomed to their rejection. And uh, Dugin invited me to, to Moscow and I went. And when I went there, they treated me with respect. They treated me with affection. He and his, his whole team invited me to lecture at the State University of Moscow, which was a great honor. I don't know any other Islamic scholar who had been honored like that. I wouldn't get an invitation from Harvard or Yale or the Sorbonne or the University of London or Oxford or Cambridge. Never. I will never get that invitation. But the most important university in Russia invited me. And I <laughs> went and I lectured. And my lecture was received with respect. So I have positive views about Dugin. I had an interview with him, a long interview. I don't think it was ever published. But it, it showed a meeting of minds between him and me. We were both on the same wavelength. So I have only good things to say about Dugin. And whoever is com not comfortable with that, go your way and leave me alone. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Sheikh, because when I read it, everything that he was saying seemed to be in line with the Islamic spirit. And yeah, it just seems like us Muslims should just stop this whole um, serious scrutiny and purity testing of everyone. But moving on. Um, so Dugin also says the Great Reset offers nothing. So this is again more interesting. Dugin also says the Great Reset offers nothing, theoretically, not even remotely something that might appeal to Muslims. Is the West's unipolarity a Dajjalic trademark? If so, should we Muslims be for Dugin's Eurasian vision of a multipolar world order? There are several questions there <laughs> in one. Yeah. Let us answer the first one. Okay. There are Muslims who have eyes with which to see, and they can see and understand. And my lectures help them. And there are others who have eyes and yet cannot see. Those who have eyes and yet cannot see, whenever the Jal plays a new tune, they dance to it. And so, for them, there's a great reset. But not for those who have eyes and who can see. And I have been helping them to see. They can recognize that uh, as the French say, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. It's the same thing over and over again. The Jal is simply playing new tunes, pursuing the same agenda. So there is no great reset for the Muslim who can see. What he does is he recognizes what's happening in the world with every new tune. Like there was a tune yesterday, 
I don't know if you heard it, that when you go to the masjid, you must put on a face mask. If you don't have a face mask, you cannot perform salat. Wait for judgment day with this bidah. And secondly, that when you're performing salat, you have to stand three feet apart like monkeys. In Pakistan, they call them bandar. Huh? <laughs> yes, this is my harsh language. And they dance to the tune. They dance to the tune, you see. But those who had eyes to see, they refused to go to the masjid to part participate in that bogus salat. This is the difference between those who have eyes and who can see and others who dance to every tune that the Jal plays. So Dugin is right on the first one that yes, this is just the same thing all over again. Muslims are not going to fall for it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, as we reach the end of this interview, I recall you saying the one side of Christianity, Santa Claus Christianity, wants to arrogant, arrogantly rule the world and the other side does not. Alexander Dugin appears to be solely focused on the bringing about of the Eurasian supercontinent, the world island, <clears throat> and has laid out the foundations and framework in his books for all of Russia from the government to the public institutions to follow. This is evident in his book on the fourth political theory, which was published in 2009. In, in this book, Dugin states that he is laying the foundations for an entirely new political ide ideology, which integrates and supersedes liberal democracy, Marxism and fascism. In this theory, the main subject of politics is not individualism, which deceptively this is my comment, which deceptively sounds completely against the fitra, class struggle, or nation. So he says, it's not about individualism, but rather existence itself, which they call this German word, Dasein. I know you are famously known, Sheikh, as an eschatologist, but it seems as though people have forgotten that you are a philosopher. Uh, Dasein, sorry, if you can just bear with me. Dasein is a German word that means being there or presence, and is often translated into English with the word existence. This is a fundamental concept in the existential philosophy of Martin Heidegger. It is the philosophy of Heidegger that all of Dugin's work appears to be derived from. So my final question to you, Sheikh, is are there any parallel parallels to Islamic philosophy with regards to the existence of the human being itself over any individualism Cross, class struggle or nation? Again, always you have asked several questions <laughs> in one. It's I can't good. answer all of them. First of all, okay. Professor Dugin is a political scientist and also a man who has faith in Orthodox Christianity. To what extent he brings his faith to bear? On his political science, I am not in the position to tell because I have not studied his works. So I take him as a political scientist. I, on the other hand, yes, I have done a master's degree in philosophy. Yes, I am, uh, alhamdulillah, by Allah's kindness, pioneering Islamic eschatology. Remember that when I was a student at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies uh, in Pakistan, Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah brought a teacher with a PhD in philosophy to teach us the philosophy of history. And that <laughs> one year of study, one year and a half, with uh, Professor Dr. Burhan Ahmed Farooqi teaching me the philosophy of history. Although Professor Farooqi did not have the foundation in the Quran that he should have had to teach the subject, what he did teach me helped me to be able to build a foundation in the philosophy of history. The movement of history includes the movement of political history. Where is the world moving? In which direction the world is moving politically in history? So I, 
I have an Islamic eschatological view of the movement of history, but it's too complex for this debate. I mean, sorry, for this interview, I don't take too much time. But I, I want to see students of mine coming forward who will have a grasp of the philosophy of history, who will be able to recognize the direction of the movement of history using the Quran as the guide, because then you can see what even the political scientists cannot see. Remember, I have studied in several universities, so I know political science from the universities. Yes, there, <laughs> there is some difference between my views and those of Pro Professor Dugan, but it will be an absolute delight if two of us, he and I, could get together for a session, a long, intense session, in which he can pro he can expand and expound on his political scientist view, and I do on my Islamic eschatological view. It'll be a very exciting encounter. I, com I completely agree, Sheikh, and JazakAllah care for being patient with my long questions. Uh, inshallah, the next time they'll be shorter and simpler. Uh, so that's it for today, Sheikh. Uh, any last words from yourself? I just ask of you, those who view this video, uh, take pity on this old man and keep you, keep me in your du'as, inshallah. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. We look forward to doing this again soon. And until then, may Allah bless your trip here in the UK and every meeting, conference or event you attend. I mean, I mean, Ya Rabbi Rabbi. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That was exactly one hour, by the way, as you wanted. <laughs>